still awesome to see everyone um, as we dive into some Dynamo tech. Um, I wanted to make an announcement, which is maybe not relevant for those people who will be watching online, but we are posting um, a joint event with TAP Group um, right after this meeting or shortly after this meeting, and it will be at our Aqua rooftop deck on June 17th uh, to kind of finally meet and hang out with people in person. And um, now into a topic I, I think many will find super relevant, managing Dynamo solutions. We've got a special guest, Gavin Crump, uh, aka the Aussie BIM guru. Uh, Gavin will be incredibly, he's incredibly passionate about helping people become, quoting this from your website, uh, the best BIM users they can be. So welcome. We're very excited to have you with us. Um, please tell us a bit about yourself, your work, and anything else you'd like to share. And after your talk, we'll open the floor for a chat um, with you about anything people want to talk about. So it's a great opportunity. We're excited to make the most of it. Great. Um, thanks for having me on board. I guess I'll just kick off if, if that sounds good. Yeah. Um, so I've got a brief intro spiel in my, my slide deck, so I'll sort of wrap it in there but um but like you said um yeah i'm just very passionate about dynamo and bim and uh these user groups are really the best way to get um the message out there and bring people face to face which you know we sort of lost for a few years so it's fantastic to see um china most still still going strong and um you know I've, I've followed this user group for a while and seen some superstars like comrade sobon and you know paul Alban obviously associated that's great to see the origin of some of these people as well so um thanks for inviting me um i'll just try sharing my screen hopefully that should come through shortly um, so I guess in, in addition to just saying saying hi and talking about myself very briefly, um, today I wanted to talk about um, managing Dynamo at scale, uh, which is a, a pretty big challenge with Dynamo for anyone that has used it, um, but talk about some strategies and considerations uh, that I have to make, particularly in my day-to-day -day work where I am trying to deploy Dynamo uh, to one of the largest architectural firms um, by headcount uh, across a few offices in Australia. Um, so just get started. So I'll briefly introduce myself, then talk about the importance of scale, because uh, it is a very important term that you need to come to terms with when you start developing uh, scripts for companies. Uh, beyond then, just briefly talking about packages and Python specifically, which are two of the biggest versioning and deployment challenges for Dynamo, and then ways you can overcome those challenges, as well as other aspects of scale that you know become issues when you get further up the, up the chain of Dynamo learning. So before I kick off, very brief introduction. Uh, my name is Gavin Crump. I've worked in the AEC industry in Australia for about 11 years now, just over 11. Um, I do have an architectural background, bachelor's, master's, uh, but very quickly found passion and interest in the digital side of our industry, uh, BIM being one of those associated uh, processes attached to digital. Um, and I've been working with architects for about three to four years now as a digital lead and their national computation lead, uh, managing uh, culturally across 700 staff and probably technically across about 350 staff. It's a lot of names to remember, but it's also a lot of tools to make sure that people can run effectively as well. Um, I love the challenge. So I've worked across a few companies during my career. Um, I spent the first five years working for one company, so I got a real good taste for how companies work and then bounced my way around the industry, tried to figure out what was going on and you know what, what sort of things were going on out there and eventually realized it wasn't the companies, it was me that needed to, needed to do some reflection and became a consultant um, and eventually found my way back to a uh, bigger practice with Architectus as an initial client turned um, employer. Um, so I've been around a few places and sort of found out that there's there's similar challenges no matter where I've worked, um, that most architectural firms aren't that different from each other when it comes to business challenges, regardless of scale, um, in that there's a lot of things to learn, a lot of people to support, and not a lot of time. And I think everywhere around the world, fees are a challenge, they are diminishing, there is uh, a stronger demand to justify the value of what we do um, without just taking time away from what we do and saying, well, we've saved time, we've saved money. It often has to be a reposition of the value add. Um, tech is changing very quickly as well um, sometimes. So AI, ML, all those types of buzzwords that we're hearing and some of them that actually are no longer just buzzwords. So whilst metaverse sort of fizzled into whatever it is now, um, AI, is starting to deliver real results in some applications and areas of our industry. 
Um, sometimes te technology doesn't change too quickly. For example, most firms have been latching onto Revit for the better part of 10 years now. And, you know, we know that whilst there are things being added and changed in Revit, at the same time, there are a lot of age old challenges that the platform brings with it. This was my first project, um, $2 billion hospital. It's really where I got a passion for BIM. Um, the reason why I like to show it is whilst it was a very uh, exciting project to work on, we didn't get to use a lot of automation. Um, so I did a lot of uh, documentation of bedrooms. Um, these six sort of triangular shapes are effectively inpatient unit pods and there are about 800 bedrooms in them. I spent about the first half year of my career just keynoting, um, adding tags to things in bedrooms. Um, so it really did show me how much manual work there was in AEC if you weren't able to automate. Um, Dynamo was only really just coming around as I started working on this project. So whilst I was aware of it, it wasn't really an application in a shape that I could deploy and engage with right now. It wasn't built into Revit. There were very strong IT policies on a state project like this. So unfortunately, I didn't really get to Dynamo until a little bit later in my career. Um, like I said, I switched to consulting. I've got a YouTube channel. Um, I decided that it was better to try and give information to more people than just focus on the immediate confines of a company. So I made the right arrangements and agreements with the company I worked with at the time and was able to start sort of breaking the silos a little bit by sharing information and also meeting other people that were choosing to share information uh, in a more open way. So I sort of just jumped on YouTube. Um, started building videos, very low editing amounts, um, and just showed how to build Dynamo scripts, how to build things that actually I run on a daily basis in my current work. Um, as you can see, I had a lot of custom packages installed. I was very new. Um, I wasn't really an expert at that point, um, so there's a lot of packages there. We will talk about packages later, um, but I definitely was, was um, excited and passionate to share this new thing that I was beginning to see results from. And with that, it sort of grew a bit of a following which is really fun. So about 350 videos at the moment, they're all over the place. They don't just cover Dynamo, um, but Dynamo is arguably probably what the channel is best known for. So I do program as well. So Dynamo itself is programming in a sense, but it has led me to written programming. So Python is where I've spent the majority of my written programming time. I am starting to learn C Sharp a bit more. Um, partially through the help of um, the Zero Touch Node course from John Pearson, which I'm really hoping to really brush off the dust off the shelf for when I get a free moment. Um, that, that sort of at least motivated me to start looking into this more. So I have been just taking various C Sharp courses. I don't know if the channel will delve into C Sharp. It is a deep space. There's a lot to learn. Um, and with that comes a lot of time if you want to teach it. Um, but at the same time, I have been teaching Python on my channel uh, via Dynamo and PyRevit. And network, networking is really how I've met most of the people I know, both socially and in person. So I do want to re-emphasize to anyone here at a user group that this is just so valuable to have these opportunities. Um, and I want to reiterate to the hosts here that this is fantastic to see active user groups, you know, um, triumphing beyond, you know, the pandemic that has still left a really big mark on our ability to come together as an industry. And I always tell people, tell people who you want to be. Um, this really is how my career really worked out. I just did some things, said, here's some stuff. What do you think? And people liked it. Um, and from here, I've been able to collaborate with a lot of really interesting people. Like you might recognize Nic Nicholas Catelia um, from Revit or BIM Pure now, um, who I've done some webinars with. It's just really fun and exciting to meet all these people um, that really are passionate about the same things as me or similar things. Anyway, um, architecture itself, like I said, is, is a challenge. 700 people, seven offices, about half the company is on tools uh, on a daily basis. Um, how does it all actually work? Well, it's not just me. Um, it, it's a lot of people. So my team is about roughly 20 people that support the business at a BIM level. It, it's very unique. Um, but of all these people, I'm probably really the main one that is dealing with PyRevit, Dynamo, Grasshopper and Rhino Inside Management, um, which obviously is a huge amount of work to get this to even just my own team, let alone the whole company. But having this amount of support has been amazing. Um, and it's something that I've, I've never got to experience at any other firm. And uh, it's great to see when firms invest in a digital team um, or has the ability to do so. There are other firms like HOK, for example, is known for this, uh, but it's not that common to see this many people uh, directly recognized in digital. 
So I work in the systems and development team. We're sort of off projects for the most part. We do help projects. So I do build scripts for particular project scenarios, uh, but really our focus is scaling solutions across the business um, using a variety of software. So this is sort of our bread and butter applications um, that I'm dealing with or dealing with people dealing with. There are some fun ones there, like Azure by Microsoft is a, a data storage solution we use. Um, Unity, there's a team running Unity in our office building airports in game design software, um, which is pretty amazing. So not all of it's every day, um, but a lot of it is stuff that we're familiar with. But that brings me to scale, sort of the point of what we're here to talk about. Um, John Pearson sums it up perfectly with his pinned Twitter post. Um, if you have to say it works, if, then it doesn't work. So it's very hard to make Dynamo or any tool or solution work in a company if there's all these conditions you have to meet in order for it to work. Now, at the same time, this quote doesn't mean you can't use a custom package, you can't use a dependency. Um, it just means you have to make sure people are set up in a position where when they go to hit that button, it works. Um, and anyone that's built Dynamo scripts will know it's not that easy to make sure when you hit that button, it works. Ultimately, we're trying to build a sort of the opposite of a pyramid scheme in getting people to use our tools. I feel. So we're really trying to get people excited about a tool. They tell three people, they tell three people. And before you know it, you've got a majority of the company at least aware of what's possible. Um, this takes time. It's hard to do. I know so many people, and I've been that person in a company who is the only person in the whole company running Dynamo. And it's so hard to get people just interested that little bit in the first place. And just remember, if you are that person that once upon a time, you weren't interested in it either. It does take time to get there, but I guess we're really trying to get people to enjoy these tools and see the value. But the problem with that comes is if, if any layer of that pyramid suddenly thinks the tools don't work, it's very easy for that message to get sent as well. So if you haven't dealt with the scale before these tools really spread out across the company, um, if something doesn't work, it's a big problem. There's a lot of aspects of scale to think about. Some of them are very simple. Will my tool work tomorrow? Will it, will it work if I go to another project? or open it on someone else's computer. Uh, they're probably the three most common scale challenges because if you build a tool and it doesn't work on someone else's computer or it doesn't meet a certain condition, it's very hard for that tool to scale. From there, there's things like versions of software, which is very relevant to Revit. Um, in different software, if you're running an interoperable solution that maybe works in the cloud and talks down to other programs like Speckle, for example, or maybe it needs to work at different companies. Maybe you're building a product for um, uh, any company that buys your product. So that's a, a big consideration. And one really recent one that's really relevant, we'll talk about this shortly, is working in different .NET frameworks. Um, Revit 2025 actually changed the framework that it was targeting. It's dealing with .NET Core 8 now, it's called. Um, and it's brought a lot of changes with it. But ultimately, like I said, if you run a script in Dynamo Player, and it says run completed with warnings, most users aren't going to go and read the warnings. They're just going to stop playing with your tool. Um, that can be a really big challenge. It's hard to get a Dynamo script not to return warnings if you're running it in a very loose way. Um, you can build Dynamo scripts to suppress warnings in very interesting ways, um, typically using the function apply node, um, but th this is a big challenge. So you almost need to pre-educate your users. Don't freak out if you see this warning and there's a culture that needs to be managed here before you even really release these tools into the wild. It could be for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the most common ones is a custom node or package is not present on that user's computer, throws an error, sends a null, and the rest of the script errors out. There's other things too, which are more frustrating um, that come from Dynamo and Revit versioning itself. For example, in Revit, I think Revit 2023 it was, um, the set parameter by name node for, for a little bit of time, quite a long time actually, um, couldn't deal with integers um, because there was a change to the way that some of these uh, types of data were handled behind the scenes. And this is a very crucial node and an integer is a very crucial data type. So to suddenly have an error for this very common thing um, lit up the forum straight away like Christmas. Um, and it wasn't actually really truly fixed until a hot fix that came almost before the next version of Revit. Um, so it's very hard to handle these as a user. That's where having a connection to the community through the forums and other mediums becomes crucial so that you can be aware of these issues, but also flag them to the team and potentially force solutions through. 
Um, as well as this, people might be familiar with the if node, where in the past for a few versions, if you sent through two lists of different sizes, um, it would always return the shortest representation of whichever list you chose. So it effectively made this node almost useless for the most part. Um, and they fixed it eventually, but then it meant if your script went back to an old version and it used the if node, it might not work. As well as this, you sort of learn tricks and what's available in certain builds and how to build scripts that can go across version. A really common issue in Dynamo is dropdowns. If you use a dropdown in one version, you go to a new version, if there's more options in that dropdown via what we call an enumerated outcome, um, you will sometimes not be sitting on the default position of that dropdown. So what might be generic models in one version is not going to be generic models in another. So you learn workarounds like specifying category by name where the dropdown behavior isn't part of the process of running the scripts. As well as this, sometimes really big changes come, in, come into effect. So I think it's in 2023, they superseded element types and brought in element classes, which are more similar to the Revit API itself. Um, so a lot of things suddenly had to be changed and rebuilt. Now, element classes, way better. They're much, much more flexible. You can do a lot more with them and they're closer to the API, which teaches you more about the Revit API. But it was a big change for people that were used to having this node available to work with. Sometimes the Revit API can't do some things. Um, it's being written basically from the ground up in some areas of Revit. Um, Revit didn't always have an API being produced by Autodesk um, until later on in its life. So in this case, you will find on the Revit API docs that some methods and properties and even classes uh, may not be supported in certain builds. So some nodes just won't work in certain builds. For example, in 2022, they added the ability to create ceilings using the Revit API. So if you took a script that built ceilings back to 2021, it wouldn't work. And like I said, Revit API is now targeting Netcore 8, which for people that aren't aware of what this means, effectively just means they're dealing with a, a different framework. There's things that come with this where certain functions that used to work probably now won't work. You have to do them in different ways. You might have to do what's called multi-targeting, where you, you actually are checking which build you're running in and doing different things depending on what you find out. Um, it, it is a big change and a lot of add-ins have actually had to really change in the background uh, to accommodate for this, but it basically means you may have to build entirely different versions of the same thing uh, to work across the 2024-2025 divide. Some add-ins just haven't had time. Um, I use PyRevit at work and I'm sitting here biting my nails currently hoping that at some point the 2025 support will land. Um, at the moment, I've had to put a big stop sign up to my team and say, if you want all my cool PyRevit tools I'm building, you're going to have to wait before you upgrade. Um, luckily, we don't tend to upgrade too quickly because of things like this, um, but it can be difficult when there's these major changes that come and hit the way that we work. So one thing in Dynamo is when you run a script, it just has to run the whole way through. Um, errors, warts and all. Um, if you use PyRevit, C Sharp, other add-ins, you get these things that I like to call flow control where you can tell the script, stop. If you hit this point, just stop. Um, now you can do this in Dynamo using one Python block, but you can't really do it across multiple nodes. Dynamo expects that data is gonna flow the whole way through all your nodes when you hit run. So in this case, for example, I'm using PyRevit in this case, you can do this in Dynamo um, to ask Revit, which version are you? And if you're less than 2022, um, stop. Just say, sorry, this tool doesn't work in this version. That way when a user, runs this, they see an error, they go, okay, I understand now, I'm not gonna freak out, and never use this tool again. And this just uses a very basic Python conditional, um, if then else, basically. If we get it, go for it. If we don't, do something else. You also get try and accept, uh, which is a, an abused concept in Python, I find. If you're using C-sharp, you'll probably be more familiar with try and cat, or throw and catch, or Try and, try and catch. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm trying to delete an element. And if for any reason I can't delete that element, just return one or zero. And I use those to build a total for a message saying I deleted X out of X elements successfully. Um, and this means that my script will get past this error. It won't trigger a warning or an error. But of course, again, it's a Python thing. It's not quite the same as how Dynamo deals with errors. It won't, it won't return a null in this case. So like I said, scale has to think about all these types of things, and a lot of these things are very Dynamo specific, uh, but they're things you still have to consider when building, deploying, and deploying tools. 
packages are a really important part of this, the good, bad, and the ugly, I like to call it. I mean, packages are awesome. They give you access to all sorts of things uh, that Dynamo isn't built to do as it comes. So they're not a bad thing. Um, they just need to be managed carefully. Um, so the community, the great thing about packages is it's really the community's way of giving back to everyone in a more organized way than just, hey, here's a script, here's a script, here's a script. Um, a lot of nodes and packages are almost like mini scripts in themselves. Um, and a lot of packages really are almost essential to running scripts. So data shapes, for example, to generate user interfaces is a crucial component of how some people build Dynamo scripts for their company so that they can generate more complex input forms than what Dynamo player would support. Um, the bad. So there are some things that aren't so good. Uh, for example, since 2022, no, 2023, I think it is, yep, uh, you need to install Python again to support packages that use this older version of Python. Um, and the new version of Python doesn't do everything that the old version does. So in some regards, some packages have chosen to stay with this Iron Python package as the one they use. Some of my nodes in my own package still depend on Iron Python. Um, so that there's this addition of dependency and expectation that people will read notes on the packages saying, please do this, please do that. So we go back to that concept of it works if, so in this case, some could say this doesn't work anymore. It's getting too complicated. Um, so in this case, that's sort of a bad thing, but you can work around it, right? It's not necessarily a, a very bad thing. Of course, you get the ugly as well. And this is that the package manager is full of packages that are no longer supported by people. Um, I like to call them the chaff packages, the ones that you see when you boot up and it says test one, test two, or it's a really great package like Steam nodes that just hasn't been updated since 2016. Obviously, these packages haven't considered things that have changed in Dynamo since they were built. They're going to have errors. They're going to have issues. So people break out the Python. They muck around with it. And before you know it, you've got all these rogue Python blocks that don't work as well. Um, so that's that's a pretty big problem. Um, a lot of them aren't even real packages. They're just something that someone uploaded to test something. So you'll get a package with one version, a bad name, and God knows what's in it. So it can be a little bit dangerous as well if these packages you know, aren't really moderated, which arguably they're not really. There are some probably some automated levels of moderation on these things, but at the same time, there's a lot of chaff on there. And most packages won't generally account for versioning limitations. There are a few that have made the choice to add subversioning to the packages you install. For example, Archilab has different versions you can install uh, depending on the version you're in, but you have to actually expand its description and choose the, the version very carefully, which no one ever does. They come to the forums. Why doesn't it work? Go look at the description, <laughs> read the docs. There are lots of packages that I recommend. I'm incredibly biased, of course, by recommending my own package, Crumple, um, but I have upgraded this recently so that most of the nodes use C Python 3, which means it should run as it comes in any build of Revit after 2020. Um, so in this case, I have intentionally cut off my package from older builds of Revit now. Unfortunately, it's just something you have to do over time. Um, Rhythm for Dynamo by John Pearson is mostly written in C Sharp with zero touch nodes. So it's very reliable. And John has actually set up a self installer that goes to his GitHub and gets the latest version um, so that it doesn't really use the package manager anymore. It just uses the package manager to start that process, which is really cool. Uh, data by Mustafa Reliubi um, is dealing with uh, custom uh, interfaces and it has been upgraded for 2025 to my understanding. Clockwork for Dynamo is a mainstay package that a lot of people have been familiar with. It's probably one of the oldest and well-supported packages from a legacy perspective, and there's a lot of great things in there. It's mostly in Python. I think it's actually all in Python, so you can see how it all works as well, which is great. Spring Nodes deals with geometry a lot, which I like. Uh, not many packages do deal with that, so I find Spring Nodes is a great way to learn about how to work with geometry in Python. And Genius Loco, is probably my favorite package. It's just a very dependable and very versatile package. And the package manager is very available on the forums, which is great as well. So good work, Alvin. Um, Orchid is a funny one. It does deal with family documents, which my own package has started to do uh, more often lately. Um, but it, it's available via GitHub, which is why a lot of people have find it challenging. Um, the author doesn't use the forums anymore for various reasons. But it is still a pretty reliable package written in C Sharp for dealing with family documents. So behind the scenes, a package is just generally a collection of files, or it might be a DLL that wraps them all together if it's a zero touch package, but really it's just files. So 
with this comes options of how you can deploy these packages. Um, in, in principle, these files basically just tell these nodes how to build themselves as both Python blocks, nodes, etc. You can open them in Notepad. I think they're a JSON format in how they're read. Um, so they are very much human readable, even if they're in a raw format. Um, but really, you, most packages will deal with Python inside nodes, inside these DYFs, which the package then wraps together when you open up Dynamo. But how do you actually deploy um, both this and just generally um, the culture of using these tools? Well, you have to do a few things to make it work, in my opinion, um, whether that's either having a very capable IT team willing to support you or having a market sourced package solution, package management solution. Now, you don't have to use packages, but I think you miss out on so much in Dynamo if you don't use them. So generally, if you're going to deploy, I recommend having a way to get packages to computers or having a culture that is just so tight that you know everyone knows how to get their packages up to date, but that's a very hard condition to set up in a company. Um, this is the hard part. You really do have to test your scripts in every build that you want to support because there's a lot of unpredictable ways that nodes can behave if you're not familiar with the Revit API and changes between versions. Some people might know it well enough that they just know what's going to work, what's not going to work, but I still say test them in every version you want to support. And for most firms, that can be five plus builds of Revit. It's a lot of work. As well as this, um, I recommend that you avoid um, nodes that you know don't work well in different versions. So I don't actually use a lot of dropdowns, which sometimes makes scripts a little bit harder to run. Um, for example, rather than picking sheets or views from lists, I usually get the user to select them from the browser. Then I use Python to collect what the user has selected. So most people using my scripts at my work know that I'm not usually going to see an input if I need to run something across a view or a sheet, which means you can actually run the script with nothing selected, nothing happens, no warnings. There's some benefits that come with it. There's a node in Crumple, my custom package, that uh, lets you retrieve the elements that are selected if you're curious to see how I make that work. Um, but most importantly, you have to train your users. Um, you can't just throw Dynamo scripts on the server and say, there it is, have fun. Um, you can't just make a video and say, watch my video. Um, it has to be an active and a supported culture, which is really hard. I mean, just getting people into a room, into a virtual room, getting them off a project for five minutes is very difficult. Even if they don't feel like they can be in the room, often project leaders might not want them to be in the room. They're like, sorry, you know, 90-10 is the ratio these people need to work at. It's really 100-0 for a lot of people, but um, getting that 10 is often quite difficult. Um, you can copy packages into these folders in app data roaming on the user's local computer, and that will effectively give them the package. Uh, some packages don't work this way, but a majority of them, especially the Python ones, are generally more than happy to be unzipped or copied into these directories for the Dynamo build, but you will need to know exactly which Dynamo builds users are dealing with. So when you run Revit updates, for example, you might end up with a new uh, version folder. So keep an eye on these if you are managing packages. You can use RoboCopy or RobustCopy uh, batch scripts just to copy from a directory to another directory. Um, this requires your IT team to give you a certain degree of trust. Uh, most companies will block batch scripts um, by default. So this usually is a bit of an iffy solution for most companies, but you can look at using user groups, so computer user groups. Again, you're gonna need IT to really help you with this properly in most companies. Um, because this generally isn't available to anyone but the IT department. And beyond that, you can even look at customized applications that deal with this. For example, PDQ is a well-known one that can literally tell computers once they're turned on, copy these files to these folders or install this software or tell me if the, the BIOS is out of date. It's a very powerful application. Whether it comes cost, whether it comes management and overhead, you've got to get it on all the computers. There's a lot of things that come with it, but I know some firms that are sailing with PDQ. You can also look into custom solutions like Orchestra. Uh, this is built by Mustafa, who also builds Data Shapes custom package. Um, and this allows you to effectively deploy and run Dynamo scripts through a cloud, a cloud portal. Um, and this also deals with its own dependency management as well. It will install packages for you, which is quite unique. Um, of course, it's a paid solution when you want to run it across more than one user. Um, but it does have a free single user version if you're curious to see more. Um, so do check it out if you haven't seen it before. But you have to make it work. 
That, that's ultimately what it's all about. There are a lot of things that just will stop it from working. Uh, the biggest one is just if no one is dedicated to supporting it. That's the biggest problem. And I mean someone that has to be responsible, has to be blamable. <laughs> that, that's a, a hard position to put yourself in, but you do have to be in that position. Um, you have to invest in training, whether it's time or material. Either way, it's time. Either way, it's money. Um, it might be a business case to your company. You might need to build something to prove it as a business case, um, which is difficult if you don't have the time in the first place, but that's a necessary component. Um, if people think things just have to work, that's a very dangerous culture um, where people aren't appreciative that software is hard. Software is challenging. Um, software doesn't always work. That's part of finding the bugs, fixing the tools, making sure it can work. So you need that as part of your culture. Um, if you depend on people installing packages, like I said, that's not usually going to work. A lot of people that run your tools will not understand Dynamo any deeper than the button they press. And with that, they won't know how to install packages unless you put a lot of work into training and culture. And that's a lot of work. Um, and like I said, you have to test new releases. There's just no option. Um, if you haven't already looked at it already, Revit does have a preview beta that you can sign up for, which does give you access with a lot of of, of, of the obvious caveats around it of what you can and cannot say about it. Generally, just don't say anything except for the fact that it exists. Um, and that will give you a sneak peek and a testing environment that you can work with before it comes out. Not everyone is allowed to use the preview beta, um, but a lot of people can be invited. And I think you can drop a request. Like I said, Python does have a lot of issues bridging various builds. Um, but really, for the most part, Revit 2020, I just write it off these days and say, I hope we don't have to use it on many projects. Um, no new projects at my company use anything lower than 2023. And ideally, once we figure the 2025 thing out, we may jump to that at some point. Um, but really, yeah, 2020 is sort of the, the build that we're trying to sort of get rid of at this point. It's, it's a very old build, and it's where they broke the Python engines into two in 2021. Um, but I guess there are other places you can go beyond Dynamo. Um, Dynamo is not really intended to be your final destination as a programmer. I think the way it's built, it's more of an educative environment than necessarily a full uh, deployment and you know um, programming environment per se. It does a lot of things and it can do most things if you know how to build it. Uh, but in this case, you know, do look at least at ways to repackage the experience for your users. There are toolbar creators that still run Dynamo scripts like Relay, Nonica, PyRevit to some degree as well, um, where you're still running Dynamo behind the scenes, but the user doesn't have to go through Dynamo Player. With that comes the exception you'll need like data shapes to create user interfaces in most cases. Um, but this can be a good bridging environment to help your users engage with Dynamo more comfortably, especially if they're used to running add-ins. From there, I highly recommend PyRevit and Python-based scripting. Um, it's a really good bridge into C Sharp. There are a lot of commonalities between Python and C Sharp. Um, and it will help you learn about the Revit API and building tools without the visual environment available to you, which is really scary at first. Um, but eventually you'll actually find that you're probably going to be back in Dynamo doing a lot of things in Python just because of how much easier some things are. From there, of course, developing add-ins in C Sharp is the, a very common uh, destination for people. Um, but I always encourage people to figure out why they want to and why they need to and they might find that they can fall back on the, the, the previous two options for a little bit of time, just to make sure that they don't completely outpace their company and their peers and give them no chance of catching up and following you. Because if you're on your own in the space, it can be hard, um, it can be quite isolating and it's quite scary if you have no one that can QMS or review your code, um, which I've been in the position of before. I won't say where and why and how, but it, it's a dangerous space to be. So do try to bring people with you if you can. And of course, from there, you can build your own Dynamo packages that you don't deploy to the package manager, but you still deploy across machines. So I've done this before as well. Um, and that can be a really good way to expand on Dynamo using packages, but in a very controlled way. But above all, um, you've got to make it easy for the end user. Um, accessibility is the key. Without that, they're not going to follow you. So you have to document your tools, use wikis, use resources, uh, do presentations, record them, uh, make them accessible, make yourself accessible, um, build a culture, a team, people that can share knowledge and also troubleshoot with you as well. Um, your users are your best troubleshooters generally. They're gonna be in live environments, they're gonna be finding out the really weird things you didn't think about. Um, it's essential that they feel comfortable doing that. And I guess if you're in charge, I do encourage people to keep upskilling. 
it, it can be easy to forget that, you know, whilst we are a long way ahead of our users, they're not really trying to be like us. We're on a very different career pathway. Um, so don't get too comfortable in what you're doing. Keep challenging yourself. And that sort of wraps up my summary of sort of scale, deploying Dynamo. Um, you can reach out to me at um, aussiebimguru at gmail.com, or you can just jump on my channel, drop me a comment. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to be contacted and I try to mentor people whenever I get a chance as well. Um, but yeah, happy to sort of just have a quick round table or a chat if, um, if that sounds like a, like a plan. And thanks for um, having me along as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yes. Um, and you. I will post uh, to our meetup group link to your channels. I think you have a ton of informational um, videos. I, I mean, I you, you know, you've only uh, kind of scratched the surface there of, of kind of all the information that you've posted. So I just want to tell you how thankful I'm for that. But I should let people ask questions really yeah, good to, to this. Um, we got a little little coda there as well. I'm going to start out with, I think, early, very beginning of your presentation, you said that uh, the uh, the Dynamo has completed this run with a set of errors or whatever, and that that can scare people yeah. off. I feel like in that statement is the tacit implication that people in Australia actually read what those warnings are is that the case because that is not the case in the us yeah um depends on if you're in dynamo and seeing like the really full-on error like a lot of people just jump straight to the forums copy and paste it and say what's this mean uh that, that's pretty common which is okay because at least they're going to the right place to ask the right question um but yeah generally the the run complete with errors is often the end of the line for a lot of people's reading um in australia too so don't worry i, I relate <laughs> i relate as well um, getting people to read is, is often <laughs> the biggest challenge of all. Um, maybe AI will help. They can read it for them and translate it right down to the layman terms that we're, because some of those errors are very yeah, non, non user friendly. Um, even I read some of them and go, what on earth is this? Like, like sometimes I have to read them too and just go, this doesn't make any sense. Like they throw an error code at you, like in a hexadecimal format and you go, okay, cool. I, I don't know what that is, but, but, um, you learn over time as a programmer, how to sort of almost work with those errors because they often like throw little codes at you that you can just go and Google then and then it tells you, oh, this is because Excel or something like that can't do this. But yeah, for a, a standard user, that's yeah, way too much, <laughs> too much time for them. So I relate. <laughs> Did anyone else have any other questions or? I, I guess I'm I not a... Yeah, I, I guess I'm not a Dynamo user, but I just joined this call just to hear a little bit of what is possible so I can uh, automate uh, my workflow uh, yeah, as yeah. best as possible. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, it's also targeted at non-users, this type of presentation, because um, I guess there's a two-way understanding required between the um, between the users and the architects and the programmers themselves, because we're yeah, we're, we're, we're both pulling our hair out on both sides of the fence and there's challenges we, we both deal with. Um, and I find empathy is actually the, the most important part of um, just making this work, going, we, we get it, like the stuff's complicated, we, we know it's frustrating, but at the same time, you know, the architects sometimes, if it's good when they're like, hey, we get it, like you're doing some pretty wacky stuff there and it like that, that bridge is like so crucial. Um, so even just, yeah, seeing these things, I guess, helps um, show you that, that side of the fence too. So that's great. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, I uh, I had I had written a Python package, I think it was back in 2016, maybe I don't know. It was a while, and I uh, I kind of yeah, I'm one of those people that stopped managing it because I mean I got all the Python down, but I couldn't figure out how to find out what the Revit version was when it changed yeah. version, and it used two different calls between the versions, and I was like, whatever, I'm done with this now. Um, <laughs> but I saw it in your screen in your in your slides, so. Might be time to revisit a little bit. So, oh, that's okay. I mean, it's natural for things to eventually probably become unsupported. Um, it's just what sort of shape do you leave them in? I guess is more the consideration. So, with Crumple, my own package, I will have to stop supporting it eventually. 
um, but I'm trying to build it into such a shape that, like, like you said, it can find the versions, it can know when it's, you know, out of its depth and warn the user. So I'm building some outputs into some of my nodes that actually just literally say error report and tell you I, I just can't run um, and try to send empty data at least versus null so it doesn't break the whole, the whole script. Um, so I think it's a natural transition. So I don't feel guilty about that. Um, there's not too many package authors that have really stood the test of time. Um, I think really John Pearson, Alvin with Genius Loci, Conrad with Archilab and um, Andreas with Clockwork and Mustafa with Data Shapes. They're the main ones that come to mind. There's other ones for sure, but it, it's a small handful of people that have really, you know, stuck around and made it work. And it's it's frustrating to make it work too. Just go and look at John Pearson's Dynamo comments in the forums. He's He's been very frustrated with some of the deployment challenges he's facing lately. So um, it's, it's it, I can understand why people run out of time. And, you know, I, I, I bought a house the other week and I'm getting married and probably having kids eventually. So I'm sure, you know, different priorities take away our time as well. So um, it's admirable that you took the time to even do it in the first place, right? That's the, that's the thing you, you made the effort. So that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah. How how is your um so so you I mean I'm sure you use PyRevit and Dynamo interchangeably, and um I was just wondering so like how how do you sort of decide like on on day to day basis like what's um what to use what's sure, or or yeah. what to have your what what's like maybe easier to to have people use uh, yeah. of what you build. Yeah, um, good question. I think um, PyRevit has naturally become what I really feed to the company as the like, you can run this anywhere sort of solution. Um, so the tools are very carefully deployed and set up and I've built the toolbar so it can reinstall itself off of our SharePoint and made it very easy for a user to keep up to date. Um, mm -hmm. Dynamo has become sort of a mixture of project specific like solutions that don't make sense to put in a scalable environment. Um, so I don't tend to build little PyRevit py tools where it's only for one project. I just usually pull my Python code back a layer, bring it back to Dynamo and I can start customizing it, give a Dynamo script to a team and say, this is safe to run in X version. Um, usually record a little video showing how it works for them to repeat it later. Um, and, and then from there, I also use Dynamo to see geometry. So when you're writing in PyRevit or in C-sharp, you don't see any geometry. You have to picture it in your head, which is really difficult sometimes. Whereas if you go back to um, Dynamo and write in Python, you can convert your geometry at the end of each Python routine to a Dynamo geometry. So you can still see it in 3D. Um, so a lot of C-sharp developers still go back into Dynamo quite a lot um, just so they can actually test and see the, the, the geometric objects and shapes and intersections they're trying to use in their code um and and it's still like a fantastic platform for just smashing out some quick dirty code as well for myself so i i use it very regularly just to build a very quick little you know mini little bim link almost where i just want to do a very particular task and sometimes i don't even save the script it's that flexible of a tool for me i'm just doing a temporary thing um so that's sort of what dynamo has become and then I also use it as an introduction to programming. If anyone asks me, I want to get started. Um, throwing PyRevit at them would just be like throwing the full book at them. It's too much. Um, but it's a little bit more friendly to wrap Dynamo up into a paper plane and throw it their way and they catch it. And it's much more manageable as a metaphor. Um, so it's still how I get people started in programming if they're curious. And it's where I recommend anyone begins if they're curious as well. Yeah. Thanks. Have you tried any of the large language models assistance in programming and um what is your experience with i don't sure, know success yeah. rates so i myself haven't used it in dynamo but we do have a web development team we collaborate with who is basically building us our own company chatbots and um shared mm -hmm. chatbot scrapers that can find resources that we've built over time and i think what we've found is the language models are very robust um easy enough to work with they do obviously cost money that's one of the first hurdles to get your business over that every character or you get out of a prompt is going to cost you money um but at the same time if you can prove that you know you're saving the business active time it's it's a pretty easy sell it's not that expensive but what we found is you need good data that's probably the biggest hurdle and it's always been the hurdle for AEC. we have all these amazing tools that can do things but often our data just 
I'll be frank, it just sucks. Sometimes it's not structured. It's um, all sorts of formats. It might be PDF, it might be an unworkable format. Um, and we found that by having a really robust SharePoint wiki system, we immediately had um, quite a lot of structure to work with, um, but had to think about keywords, headers, titles, how we flag different layers or priorities of data. And I think that's what the LLL, LLM platforms will sort of assume when they make it to our modeling applications, they'll go, hey, you need like some pretty good structure in place for me to understand what matters, what doesn't. Um, so I sort of encourage people to look towards things like the IFC schema, for example, as an example of um, the industry trying to figure out what an AEC specific schema looks like. Um, even if you don't use IFC, it sort of starts to signal the, the, the priorities, you know, like building site level class instance that, that have to naturally be in place for these types of models to know what matters so that they don't look for the very bottom level of data before they've made their way down from the top. So I think that, that that's where I'd encourage people to look at before they really dive into the LLMs. How good is your data? Um, how workable is it? If you asked an average person to find something, could they do it? If not, probably your LLM is not going to be able to either. Um, so, so that's sort of where, where we found it. So when you say the IFC, do you do you really, or uh, when you say IFC so is an industry specific format, do you really mm -hmm. think that our industry is going to maintain their own unique formats, or do you think they're going towards the PSD, like the the Pixar scene mm -hmm. description, which se yeah. it seems like we're really piggybacking off of video game development. Um, Trying but... yeah. Yeah, I agree. Schemas are hard. Um, I think that we've tried in the past, and IFC to some degree has succeeded by at least having Building Smart International as a you know, unofficial parent. They don't necessarily, you know, technically manage it all the time, but they at least try to culturally and socially manage it, um, which is a start. But I I'm not sure that IFC is necessarily the the one that everyone's going to accept. I think it's already had a lot of um, adoption challenges for most people, even if it is just because learning a schema is hard and Revit doesn't naturally just give you a perfect IFC. You have to put work into making it output that way. Um, I mean, it might be maybe, yeah, it could be like a .bim format that that's sort of having some, some work put into it. I think the destination will probably be proprietary in some aspect. I think fully open is a bit of a pipe dream. I mean, even the gaming industry has a lot of proprietary things going on in it. Um, you know, USD and some of those interesting things that we're seeing making our way towards us. Um, but I mean, I hope it's open enough that most software can at least engage with it um, because then we'll sort of see a bit of a pay to play model with the, the vendors as well. They'll say, sorry, it's still our format or it's, you know, three of us have the format no one else does. You know, the black box is just a bigger black box. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, there's a lot of platforms trying to build their own schemas of sorts like Speckle has tried to build its own sort of approach to storing data um, in a very open way. So maybe they might be worth um, looking looking at keeping an eye on because they seem to have indicated, you know, here's a way you can keep data very flexible um, without having to, you know, rework your data structure too significantly. Um, and they've had to build their own geometry wrappers and engines to preview it. There's a lot of catches that have come with it. Uh, but yeah, IFC is more, more, more just an example of a way that we could do it. Um, but not necessarily the one that we will, as an industry, inevitably end up adopting. And at the end of the day, the institutes will have to probably declare something and say, you know, you all do this, please, like to really force it in at the end of the day. Yeah, but it's hard to say. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, really good questions here. <laughs> Anyone else? Otherwise, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Anytime you're in Chicago next. Please contact us. Yeah, yeah. I would love to. I'll find myself there. I'll definitely let you know. Yeah. <laughs> See you again. I've been there once when I jumped between um, Seattle and uh, New York. I think I was going, but no, I'm Toronto. So I've stopped at O'Hare before, but um, yeah, I didn't get a time to jump out of the airport. So. <laughs> that was awesome. And and um, and as of as of Tuesday, they finally announced the O'Hare project publicly. That, that I mean, yes, people knew yeah. it was happening, but they showed renderings. So the yeah, next time yeah. you may be in something that I. That I worked on. Yeah, Humble brand. Working on their hair, yeah, so awesome. Amazing, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool, yeah. cool work. Yeah, I, I didn't realize you were on that. Yeah, that's very, very cool. Yeah, good work. Yeah, yeah. It was great. I saw that announced the other day as well. So very cool. Yeah. Finally, nice where you can sort of breathe a sigh of relief and talk about it publicly at everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thank you so much.
thank you so much again very nice to yeah, meet well, thanks you thanks for having me along and thank thanks you. for having me along and to anyone in the recordings thanks for watching yeah. <laughs> keep in touch guys thank you, cool. Have a thank good you. Day. See you later. bye thanks bye